So good afternoon. We're here today at Boston Med Flight's facility at Hanscom Airfield to thank the team here for their work to support patients throughout the pandemic. Before I get to the purpose of today's visit, I do want to give a quick update on Tropical Storm Isaias. Is Isaias? Isaias. No? What do you call it, Charmin? Isaias. Okay. The Tropical Storm. Thanks, Steve. That's very helpful. Um, yesterday, the National Weather Service, I think as everybody knows, issue, issued a tropical storm warning for Massachusetts. We're obviously continuing to monitor the forecast. The storm's not expected to impact Massachusetts directly, but we'll obviously be seeing some of the effects of it. The forecast indicates that the heaviest rain from the storm will be in western Massachusetts, with the Berkshires expecting to get two to four inches. Some flooding is possible in certain parts of western Mass and parts of the region uh, are under a flash flood warning. Eastern Massachusetts will get less rain, but we still expect to see significant wind gusts of 40 to 60 miles an hour, especially in the coastal areas. High winds will lead to downed trees and some power outages. Utilities are and have been pre-staging crews in key areas uh, along the coast and on the islands. Statewide, we expect the Tuesday evening and West Wednesday morning commutes to be impacted by both the wind and the rain. So if you're going out, you should take it very slow and allow plenty of extra time to get to wherever it is you're going. We're working with the National Weather Service and with MEMA, the utility companies, and our other partners to monitor the storm and to respond to any impacts, such as power outages and flooding that may happen as a result. And obviously, uh, we'll keep the public updated as the storm continues. Uh, and we urge everyone to use caution. And if you can, stay home and stay inside and stay safe, please do so. With respect to our daily update on COVID-19 testing cases and hospitalizations, yesterday DPH reported test results for over 12,000 individuals, which brings the total number of tests administered in the Commonwealth to almost 1.6 million. There were 165 new positive cases reported, which is about a 1.3% positive test rate. In total, there have been about 110,595 cases statewide. The seven-day positive test rate is at about 2%. 375 patients remain hospitalized for COVID-19, and of that, 64 are in the ICU. Those numbers are down about 90% since the middle of April, and currently three hospitals are using their surge capacity. Over the past several days, we've seen a modest uptick in the percentage of new positive cases and we continue to closely monitor and analyze the data to determine the factors that are driving that. As I mentioned last week, there have been several reports of clusters from large gatherings and activities where folks were not taking proper precautions. We've also been expanding our testing operation through the Stop the Spread program to offer free tests to thousands of people in over a dozen communities statewide. Stop the Spread just added its 17th community to the list, and starting Wednesday, a free testing site will start up in Framingham. The full list of communities where free testing is available is on our state website at mass.gov slash stop the spread. It's important to remember that the communities where we're running this program to expand testing were selected because they have had previously higher numbers of cases and higher positive test rates for COVID among residents than the statewide average. And we had seen a significant decline in the number of tests taking place in those communities. I can't say this enough, COVID's not taking the summer off and we can't either. It's critical for folks to remain vigilant in their daily activities. Please continue to wear face coverings, practice social distancing, and stay home if you aren't feeling well. We're not taking any options off the table when it comes to fighting COVID, reopening the Commonwealth, getting back to a new normal. It all depends in many respects on everybody playing their part and doing their job. We've only had a slight uptick from a low of 1.7% to 2%, but we'll be forced to adjust our plans uh, if the data warrants it. That could mean gathering sizes could be reduced or we could make some of our business regulations more strict. Reopening and staying open is obviously a big part of the goal, but obviously we can't do that if we don't have everybody's help to continue to move forward. We're helping remind people about the importance of masks with our hashtag mask up, mask 
Up Mass campaign, which we launched on Friday. And I want to thank partners like the Celtics and the Boston Red Sox for helping us share that message on social media. In addition, we're taking steps to protect Massachusetts' progress, even as we're seeing other states deal with surging cases. Over the weekend, our new COVID-19 travel order went into effect, and as of Saturday, most travelers to Massachusetts are required to complete a travel form and quarantine for 14 days unless they have a negative COVID-19 test result in hand. We're encouraged that literally thousands and thousands of people have already submitted this travel form electronically, and that data has been entered into our collaborative uh, contact tracing program. And after submitting that paperwork, electronically. Folks will receive test messages from our contact tracing team to remind them to quarantine unless they receive that negative test result. The new travel order applies to all travelers arriving in the, com arriving in the Commonwealth, including residents, unless you're arriving from a lower risk state as determined by DPH, or you are in fact traveling back and forth on a regular basis to a specific location for work. As families take summer vacation and students and professionals plan to return to Massachusetts for school or work, we're obviously urging everybody to adhere to the travel order and the guidance associated with it. We all have a responsibility to help keep COVID out of Massachusetts, particularly after everybody works so hard to drive down the public health trends. We can't and we should not stop now. I want to thank all the travelers who've already submitted their forms electronically and followed the guidance to date. And if you're planning to come to Massachusetts soon, please visit mass.gov slash MATraveler or text MATraveler to 888-777 for more details. Now, with respect to our visit today uh, to visit Boston MedFlight, Secretary Mary Lou Sutters and I just had the chance to join with Boston MedFlight CEO Maura Hughes to tour the MedFlate operation. We also got to spend a little time with some of the folks on the team who have certainly been very busy on behalf of the people here in the Commonwealth over the course of the past few months. Boston MedFlight teams are one of those unsung heroes that have been deeply involved in caring for many of our sickest and most vulnerable patients during this pandemic. When we confronted a surge of COVID-19 cases this past spring, our COVID-19 Command Center worked closely with our hospitals to prepare so that our healthcare system could handle the increased workload. A key part of that planning effort was working with our academic medical centers to double ICU capacity for the duration of the surge. That allowed those large Boston hospitals to care for those who are dealing with the most serious cases of COVID-19. It also enabled smaller community hospitals to better utilize their resources to care for other patients. Boston MedFlight played an unsung and crucial role in transporting very sick patients to the leading hospitals in Boston, including Mass General, Brigham and Women's, Tufts Medical Center, Beth Israel, and Boston Medical Center. Over the course of the pandemic, which remember was not a very long length of time, we're talking maybe 120 to 150 days, these crews transported nearly 700 COVID-19 patients from community hospitals to large medical centers. It's pretty sobering when you think about the fact that they had to transport nearly 1,000 people since March. During the peak of the surge, the teams were transporting as many as 12 to 15 patients a day. On behalf of everybody here in the Commonwealth, and especially on behalf of the friends and neighbors and families of those who spent time uh, in your embrace, I want to say to everybody at Boston Med, Med Flight, thank you for what you've done, for the hours you worked, for the support you provided to our healthcare system's response to these unprecedented challenges, and to your willingness to collaborate, cooperate, and just see that this work got done and done well. You provide, in many respects, a crucial link that enables our healthcare system to meet the COVID 19 surge this past spring. And that goes along with the stuff you do every single day on behalf of the people here in Massachusetts and around the region. We're grateful for everything Boston Med Flight did then, and we continue to be so. I think sometimes we forget that it was a lot of people, a real team effort, that made what happened here in Massachusetts successful. The hard work of our first responders, our frontline healthcare workers, our residents, there's significantly less strain today on our hospitals because of the collective efforts of so many people here in Massachusetts. 
And that underscores why it's so important for us to keep doing the things that we know can slow the spread of this virus. The mask. I can't express how important it is if you can't social distance, if you're in close quarters, if you're in a place where you have any concern at all about your ability to maintain distance from others, you should wear your mask. Practice good hygiene. Stay at home if you feel sick. And together, we can protect the progress that we've all made and worked so hard to achieve over the course of the past few months. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Boston MedFlight CEO Maura Hughes to talk a little bit more about their efforts. Maura? Thank you so much, Governor. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are thrilled to uh, host today's uh, briefing at Boston MedFlight. As many of you know, Boston MedFlight is a nonprofit critical care transport service, and our mission is to care for the most critically ill and injured patients in our region with our fleet of helicopters, our critical care ground ambulances, and our airplane. Our critical care nurses and paramedics take care of patients all for what are many the worst days of their lives, suffering a critical illness or injury. And as a nonprofit, we care for these patients regardless of their ability to pay or their financial status. In my role, I get to speak with so many patients, um, and they say to me, Maura, I would not be here standing talking to you right now without Boston MedFlight. Maura, my son would have not have survived without Boston MedFlight services. All day, every day, our crew, crews care for the most vulnerable patients from the premature baby who could fit into the palm of your hand to the 101-year-old having a heart attack or a stroke and every other patient illness um, or injury in between. We care for over 4,700 patients every year and have cared for over 80,000 patients since our inception in 1985. In early March, uh, when we realized coronavirus was on the horizon, our operational team got together and quickly ramped up our clinical protocols to care for these critically ill um, COVID patients. We, reta we retrained our staff on appropriate use of PPE, and we geared up our medical supplies to care for these critically ill COVID patients. We were ready before we saw our first COVID patient. To date, Boston MedFlight has cared for nearly 700 critically ill COVID patients, um, transporting these patients for needed ICU care, but also moving patients throughout the healthcare system to make sure that no one hospital was overwhelmed with ICU patient needs. Throughout this healthcare crisis, I observed an unprecedented collaboration of the Massachusetts healthcare system. Individual hospitals assisting one another, sharing staff, um, sharing ventilators, caring for each other's patients. Um, I want to acknowledge this cooperation and um, look forward to the continued cooperation in the future. I particularly want to thank the Boston MedFlight staff um, on the front lines and behind the scenes uh, for their continued uh, support of our patients. Um, our consortium hospitals who have supported us for 35 years in a nonprofit mission and for our donors who provide the much needed uh, funding for our patients. Lastly, I, I would like to thank Governor Baker and Secretary Sutters through their leadership through this health care crisis. And we are proud of Boston MedFlight um, to care for the vitally ill and injured in our system. Thank you for all being with us today. Thank you, Maura. And the one other thing I might add, um, to her remarks, they were showing us a aerial map upstairs of where the helicopters throughout this northeastern region are located, and there are about 15 of them uh, across this area that stretches sort of south into Rhode Island and Connecticut and west over into New York and and uh, north up into Maine and New Hampshire. And, uh, and they said because of the collaborative that's been developed here, the systems in the hospitals don't compete with one another to access these patients. If you were to look at, if you just move south and start to look at how this particular geography would play out in other parts um, along the eastern seaboard, you would probably see as many as 45 of these helicopters instead of just 15 because they are in constant comp competition with one another to determine who's going to get a lot of these cases. Whereas here, 
because there's a collaborative process and a collaborative venture in place. They simply make the decision to take people to the place that's most appropriate. It's much faster. I would argue it's better. And at the end of the day, it's more like the way you would hope people would work together when people's lives are very much on the line, which they are when you folks are um, in the air and on the ground. I also want to say to Representative Gordon, who's hiding over there incognito. It's nice to see you. I know we're in your district, and I'm glad that you had a chance to come out. And with that, um, questions? Yeah, so the, um, the Rhode Island uh, conversation about, um, about their test scores relative to um, our travel order is under active discussion, and we'll have something to say about that, I think, shortly. The one thing I would add to this is our travel order does have, as I mentioned in my remarks, a, um, an exemption for people who travel across the border um, for work if they go to a particular place every day and vice versa. Pardon me? Well, it's, I mean, the order itself is basically set on a particular set of um, criteria. And, um, and if you test above that criteria, which is basically 5%, um, which is the World Health Organization and sort of everybody else's standard with respect to where, um, where it's quote unquote safe, um, or safer is probably a better word, um, then um, under our order, you want people coming from your state automatically move from being able to move freely across the border uh, to moving into that status. So, um, you know, we have always talked since we got started on this um, about getting down below 5%. And that was because that was, in fact, the World Health Organization and many other organizations who study this stuff sort of standard for the difference between concern and caution and, uh, and, and safer. And, um, and we've actually achieved that a lot faster than people thought we would. I remember having press conferences with many of the folks in this room um, in the months of April and May um, where the expectation was that we might get down below 5% by the fall. Um, because of all the work that was done by the people of Massachusetts, um, we got past 5% in early June and have been down below 5% ever since. Um, what I would say is that we look at a lot of elements when we make decisions about everything we do. And again, as I said in my remarks, people should remember that we added eight communities that had higher than average test rates to our free testing program because we had seen a decline in tests in those communities in the middle of July, okay? Then we added eight more, again, based on the same criteria, right toward the end of the July, on the 27th, I believe. Um, so there are literally tens of thousands of tests that are now moving into our system from communities that had previously high test scores that are now being identified as positive test cases where we can then work with those folks to contact trace and to isolate and to support them uh, as they go through their quarantine and any of their close contacts do as well. So there are many, and we've talked last week about some of the really big clusters that have turned up through some of the work that's done by the contact tracing team. Um, this stuff all goes into a large discussion about um, about what we should do and, and how we should, we should respond. And I would argue that bringing those communities into the free testing program has definitely increased the amount of testing that's going on there and turned up cases we wouldn't have turned up otherwise. It's a really good thing. Um, but I also said in my remarks that uh, we pay a lot of attention to this data. We've been concerned and worried about um, the overwhelming, people, the overwhelming majority of the people in Massachusetts has stayed true to all the things we talked about with respect to face coverings, social distancing, hand washing, and all the rest. Um, but we've talked several times in some of our later press, most recent press conferences about the fact that there has definitely been some slippage in certain circumstances and situations. And um, 
and the point I want to make about this is we know what works. Okay? Everybody knows what works with respect to infection control. Wear a mask if you can not socially distance. Socially distance wherever you can. Wash your hands, hand sanitizer, good hygiene, wipe surfaces. I mean, this stuff is like gold standard. But you have to be vigilant and you have to be disciplined and you have to do it over and over again. Many of the clusters that I talked about last week involved situations where people didn't do any of those things. Um, so I guess what I would say is that um, we hope we will be able to continue to move forward. But if the data doesn't support moving forward, as we have said many times, we won't. I think everybody should be cautious about this. I mean, one of the biggest lessons we all learned, um, not just here but around the world, um, is that this is a contagion. Um, but at the same time, we added a whole bunch of communities to this process specifically to see if we could find additional positive cases in communities where testing levels had dropped dramatically. And we did. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Um, and I think we're going to continue to talk to the folks that we've always been talking to about this stuff, and, and if we need to make adjustments, we will. We're going to make our decisions based on what we get out of the cluster reports that we review and what the data says, because that's because that's how we got where we are today. I think we're going to look at a lot of the data and make decisions, but I'm not going to I'm not going to get into a hypothetical about that because. Uh, we're continuing to review the information that we have, which is, by the way, a lot of which is available on our website. When you mentioned the 5% figure, are there other metrics that you're looking at that would tell us that we're approaching that? Well, we've talked many times about, I mean, we have six metrics. How are we doing on contact tracing? What's going on in the ICUs? What's our hospitalization look like? Um, what's our positive test rate? I mean, these. These are the numbers we track every single day and we report on. But there are other things associated with, you know, what we see in the contact tracing data, what that's turning up with respect to clusters. And as I said, you know, we made a decision to increase our testing capacity and to make it fully available in communities where we'd seen a decline in testing, where we believed there were, in fact, additional positive cases. And there were. And that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, I think one of the things we're gonna, we are working on developing is, a, um, is an ability to do some rapid mobile testing for schools when schools open. Yeah. Sure, in a few days. I think people have been unbelievably good about complying to the uh, to the rules and the guidance that we put out. If I, I said this last week. You know, we talk to local officials all the time. We talk to uh, local business leaders. We talk to elected officials um, about whether or not people in their communities are standing up and doing the right things, whether they're an employer or an employee or a public employee or just somebody, you know, sort of private citizen. And the overwhelming majority of the response that we get from everybody is that folks are trying to do the right things. Um, we've spoken to some of the incidents we've seen where it's pretty clear to us that people have let their guard down. And, you know, I kind of respect that and I understand, I don't respect it, but I understand it. I mean, week after week, month after month of, um, of paying attention to this rule book and to these guidance 
associated with both private behavior and, uh, and, and business behavior is, um, is hard to do. And it's especially hard to do, as several people said in a recent press conference, when we're in the middle of the only part of the year that's nice around here, which is the summer. But the simple truth is, people in Massachusetts have done a really good job of complying with a lot of the guidance and the rulemaking that's been put out here. And we've seen some slippage in a few places, and I really hope we don't see that going forward, because it is going to affect our positive test rate, and it is going to affect um, the way we move forward. Has to. I think part of it has to, look, I, I'm sure there are different reasons in different circumstances and situations, but, um, you know, my wife and I spend almost all of our time with our family and with a very close group of friends who we've known for a long time. We have not been in a group of more than 10, except in a place like this, since March. But if you were to ask me if that doesn't tug on me a bit or tug on my, we have a lot of friends we have not seen for months. And we don't know when we will see them. And I think for everybody, you know, it's a bitter pill. But it is in many respects the one we all need to understand is going to be the most effective at controlling the spread of the virus. And the controlling the spread of the virus is what makes everything else possible, including, as I said previously, the ability of our health care system and our health care providers to manage the issues associated with not just COVID, but all the other stuff they deal with every day. Thank, thank you. you. And thanks again, Maura, for all your work. And thank you to the team here for all the work that you do. We really appreciate it. Representative, it's good to see you.